Hello there, my name is John Meyer, and I want to talk about how I got good enough at the mandolin in just two months. Disclaimers, enough is the key word in that sentence, and also I've been playing guitar for 30 years, so obviously some skills do translate. But back in November, I bought this mandolin because I was going to be working on a production music track or a production music album, and I've been sharing how I've gone about writing the music for that album. The goal was to use real instruments, nothing inside the box. And so in part one of the series was acoustic guitar, how I mic'd it and recorded it and came up with the part, then drums, then bass was last week, and now we're to the mandolin. I do have a mandolin that I bought years and years ago. I'll show you. It's a fine instrument. Let's see how it sounds. Probably not in tune. Yeah, not even close. It sounds okay when it's in tune, but it has some issues and it's not all that enjoyable to play and I never really got into it. I did use it on a handful of projects. I would put it in a random tuning and just strum it open, but not to the extent that I would call myself a mandolin player. Not sure if I'm there yet, but I'm closer. I've been breaking down one song, but throughout this video, I'll break down the parts in a handful of different songs so you can kind of get the idea of what I was trying to accomplish. In this track, it was a little more exposed. I've written down 10 tips that help me get better and hopefully will help you get better at the mandolin or some of them apply to any new instrument. Tip number one is get the right instrument. This is hard because there is a level that you almost always have to pay to get a quality instrument that plays good and sounds good. Anything cheaper than that, you're gonna have some compromises. Anything more expensive than that, well, it's more expensive. So finding that sweet spot, and I think I found it with this mandolin, it's an Eastman MD315. I had to rely on research as there are not many mandolins near me. This was the one that kept popping up. It made sense for the price, I went with it. Most important thing about it, it plays great. So it's gonna help me learn quicker because it plays good, and the sound is perfectly adequate for the type of tracks that that I'm gonna be putting this in where it's not the featured instrument, it's buried. Instruments that may not sound quite as amazing as the high dollar instruments often sound more than adequate in a dense mix. In everything we do, the instrument and the player is always the most important part of the equation. So, so make sure that if you're going to commit to an instrument that you spend the amount of money necessary to get an instrument that'll actually work for what you wanna do. Number two is find the right pick. Now, guitar players, we're often used to picks more like this. This one is flimsy, right? There are harder guitar picks, but most mandolin picks are very hard. This is a Dunlop. I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's a 1.4 millimeter. You can spend hours and hours researching picks for mandolins on the internet. I actually started with this monster here. It's a Dunlop. It's like a 2.5. This is what I started with, and I like the sound that I get from it. It seems to be a little darker and more mellow than these picks. This could probably go faster, play faster, and it requires me to dig into the instrument a little bit more to get that tone that I want, uh, where this doesn't require as much. So in the softer playing, this is kind of nice. At least that's been my experience. There are websites dedicated just to picks that will tell you all the reasons why you have the wrong one. But your first purchase after the mandolin itself are picks. Let me play the first section of the track I've been breaking down for the past few weeks. It's basically that part throughout. But I repeated that over and over again, and then in the breaks I would do something like... Third tip, play non-stop. That's an obvious one. If you want to get better at something, you've got to do it a lot. But with the mandolin, it's easier than say the bass guitar. I'm not gonna bring an amp into my living room and watch you know, Seinfeld at night playing my bass. But with this, I can go anywhere I want to. I bought this great strap for like $8. Just the portability of this makes it so easy to travel around. I walk around the house all the time. I'm a little rusty, I have to admit. I haven't played this in a couple weeks since I finished the album, but I would walk around the house forever playing, you know, fiddle tunes. Now, the consequence of that is my kids and wife hate me, but I've got better at the mandolin. The fourth tip, mandolin internet. There are great YouTubers out there, two in particular, Mando Lessons, check him out. 
He's super soft spoken, just easy to listen to. Hi everybody. Welcome to the Mando Lessons YouTube channel. But my favorite site is David Benedict Mandolin. I'm impressed with his tutorials and I'm also impressed with his YouTube abilities. He's put a lot of time and energy into making good videos and I respect that. One thing to keep in mind when you go look for tutorial websites, most of it is geared toward bluegrass sounds or old fiddle tunes and I like that, but that's not necessarily the kind of music that I wanna play. I don't see the mandolin just as an old timey instrument. Obviously, if I wanna make a bluegrass production music album, this is a great tool but I don't want everything to sound bluegrass when I put it into other styles of music. Keep that in mind when you find a new site and most of the music maybe doesn't fit what you want to make. The skills that you learn making that music will translate to other genres. Number five is a big one, posture. Us guitar players and bass players especially like to you know look cool and all that and sometimes you'll see a mandolin player in like a pop band or a folk band who's who's got the band kind of like this. That's really not the way it's supposed to be played. You really need to get the posture right to get the best tone out of the instrument and to make it work with your hands. You don't play the mandolin the way you play an acoustic guitar with your fingers like this. There's an angle to it. And the only real way to get that, and oftentimes I like to stand up, and this strap is, comes in very handy, but I don't know if I can do that. Well, you can not look at my face for a while. You wanna have it angled up and, and out so that it fits your hands properly. Instead of coming straight across, you kinda of come across like this. That really helps with chords, which I admit, I'll talk about this in a minute, I'm not great at some of these chords, especially chop chords. I need, I need more practice there. But the only way to get some of these tones, and especially to play fast, is to have the proper technique and to line yourself up in the right way. Otherwise, you're fighting against yourself, and that's not good. Also, with the wrist, you know, in the guitar, we're kind of doing this motion a lot, but really I found the wrist, and especially watching these tutorials from David Benedict and Mando Lessons, I forget his name, Baron Collins Hill. I think that's right. My name's Baron Collins Hill. In this week's lesson, there's not a lot of that movement. It's, it's, it's a steady movement of the wrist and the hand like this. And eighth notes are a big deal. Just keeping that movement, even if you don't play every note, there's still the same movement throughout. Number six, this applies to all instruments that I have in here is that I always learn the key of D first. And I know that can get kind of boring and I can play in other keys. I know that I've written a lot of production music tracks in the key of D. Why does it matter if I've written in a bunch of other tracks? They go to all different places. So if they're all in the key of D, that's fine. Although there are benefits to writing in other keys with other instruments. Sometimes G works well on the mandolin, but so does D. There's an open string right here. This is a D. So I can learn my scales fairly quickly and that gives me an open string that I can drone. Every instrument in this room, I'm at a different level of proficiency. Some I've been playing for 30 years, like the acoustic guitar. Others I just started. But if I learn that one key, then wherever I am on my journey with that particular instrument, I can at least play a song in that key. So I always start on the key of D and I suggest that you find a key that works for you. This one took a little more work. It took more work, but it's still in this same area. Then I went into a tremolo. I'm just walking up the scale here. One thing to point out, with the mandolin, it works better when you hit every note. Hammer-ons do work, but maybe not as much as a guitar. It seems to speak a little better when you hammer out each note. Number seven, melodies and arpeggios. I found that with the mandolin, because of where it is in the frequency spectrum, that you can be a little more busy. You can be a more noty. Whereas on the bass, obviously you gotta pick and choose what you do. The higher up you get, these notes are short, and they're up in a non-competing area, so you can do a little more. Learning your scales is very valuable. As you listen to the tracks that I'm playing you from this album, you can see I usually found a part and then I played it over and over again, and then I found some ways to add nuance and change that part up a bit, but they're often noty, they're often more involved than other instruments, which leads to number eight, 
play fewer chords and more like single notes and double stops. Part of the reason why chords are hard. There are some open chords that aren't quite as bad. But now you're adding in four notes or eight strings if you look at it that way with the octaves. That's taking up more space. So ease your way into it. Take up less real estate with what you're doing, but be a little more melodic. Now, of course, I'll be a more rounded mandolin player if I could play all these chords and know my way all the way up the neck and be able to back up other people while they're playing. But for this particular album, getting started, finding some success, I found that melodies and arpeggios were easier. <laughs> Sounds kind of sloppy on its own. Just doing a double stop there, two notes here and fifths. Number nine, double track. Specifically, this tremolo sound, we all know it. On one note, it's fairly easy. I'm still out of shape. I gotta tell you, it's hard for me to come on this channel and not be amazing at things. Like, I want you to think I'm great at everything, but I'm not. And I try to find ways to cover it up. But the, the opposite extreme of that is you don't ever do anything because you're not great. But to me, it's like working until you find that sweet spot that meets the threshold that you're okay with and that makes your track better without taking away from it. And this is a little trick that when it comes to tremolo, if I double it, especially if I'm doing two notes, I was better at this a couple months ago. I really worked hard. By doubling it, I can play it a little slower, and then when I mix it left and right, it sounds fuller and thicker and faster and smoother. And that trick works with all kinds of instruments and all kinds of parts. It's not just specifically for the mandolin tremolo. The more you layer a part, that often means the more you can put it back in the mix. And with a production music track, that's huge because we want our music to be present and there, but we also want it to sit behind the main dialogue. So this one I double tracked left and right. I played higher up this time. Tenth and final tip for getting better, I hope it's 10, is to use a tuner and keep it on. Well, one thing, you need to tune this thing a lot because there's eight strings and they go out of tune. But also, it's good when you're learning your way around an instrument to be able to look at the note. Like, I, oh, that's a D, okay. But that will only help me learn the neck quicker, especially when I get up into higher sections. The nice thing about the mandolin is that it's laid out in fifths, which makes so much more sense than the guitar. So I found that it was quite easy to learn, and that's gonna translate to the violin if I ever decide to make that jump. Those are my tips for getting good enough. I was good enough to play this on an album and make it sound at least the way that I heard it in my head. And I'm on my way to being a great old man mandolin player who goes to bluegrass festivals in an RV with my wife when I'm 70. That is the real goal for all of this. I still need to cover how I played the lap steel with the benders, which is really cool, and the final mix, so check back soon.